Good afternoon. I am delighted to welcome you to this event, co-hosted by the Harvard Radcliffe Institute and the Harvard Alumni Association. I am Kate Gellert, Harvard College Class of 1993 and co-chair of the Radcliffe Dean's Advisory Council. Today, we are joined by Harvard President Emerita, Drew Gilpin Faust, and Harvard Radcliffe Institute Dean, Tomiko brown Nagan, who will discuss President Faust's recent memoir, Necessary Trouble, Growing Up at Mid-Century. Let me take a brief moment to introduce our interlocutors to highly respected scholars and university leaders. Drew Gilpin Faust is President Emerita of Harvard University, Arthur Kingsley Porter University Professor, and the founding dean of the Radcliffe Institute. As president of Harvard from 2007 to 2018, she expanded financial aid to improve access to Harvard College for students of all economic backgrounds and advocated for increased federal funding for scientific research. She broadened the university's international reach, led a highly successful capital campaign, and promoted collaboration across academic disciplines and administrative units, just to name a few of the major accomplishments she has made to this university. She is the author of six prior books, which have garnered extensive praise. Tomiko brown Nagan is Dean of the Radcliffe Institute, Daniel P.S. Paul Professor of Constitutional Law at Harvard Law School, and Professor of History in the Harvard Faculty of Arts and Sciences. She is also an acclaimed author. Most recently, her book, Civil Rights Queen, Constance Baker Motley and the Struggle for Equality, was named as one of the best books of 2022 by the Los Angeles Times, The New Yorker, the Smithsonian Magazine, Time Magazine, and it won the Order of the Quaff Book Award, among other honors. Through her leadership of the Institute, Dean Brown Nagan chaired the Presidential Committee on Harvard and the Legacy of Slavery, prioritized a more explicit focus on applications of the scholarly, scientific, and artistic work conducted at the Institute, expanded collaborations with the broader community, and enhanced opportunities for students to engage in experiential interdisciplinary learning with real world impact. You can find links to both speakers full bios in the chat. So the format today, President Faust will begin with a reading from her memoir before engaging in conversation with Dean Brown Nagan. Then our speakers will take questions from the audience using the Zoom Q&A function. Before we begin, I wanna take a moment to acknowledge the members of the Radcliffe Institute Leadership Society and our annual donors who are watching this afternoon. Your generosity keeps Radcliffe programming free and open to the public, and we thank you. We also want to acknowledge the Steiner Dean's Leadership Fund for Academic Ventures, which is supporting this event. Again, we encourage those watching on Zoom to use the Q&A feature to submit your questions at any time during the program, and the speakers will address as many as they can. Since we anticipate a lot of questions, we ask that you keep them short, and this will enable addressing as many as possible in the time we have. And now, I would like to turn the virtual floor over to Harvard President Emerita, Drew Gilpin Faust. Gabe, thank you so much. And Tamiko, thank you in advance. It's a delight to be here with everyone. <clears throat> I want to begin with an apology, which is my voice is not the one you hear on the audiobook, if you've listened to the audiobook. I've been uh, fighting laryngitis for about 10 days, so I'll croak at you a bit, but I hope that I can communicate through the quotes. Croaks. <laughs> um, I'm going to begin by reading two passages from the book. The first is from the prologue, which I think will help orient us. And then I will turn to a passage that comes uh, as I'm graduating from college in 1968, just as the world is blowing up around me. So let me begin with the prologue. <clears throat> as a historian, I have spent much of my life listening to voices from the past and trying to use them as bridges of understanding to times distant from our own. Here, I am seeking to be one of those voices, 
recounting an era that fewer and fewer living humans can remember. It is time for me not just to listen, but to tell. History is about choices and about how individuals make those choices within the structures and circumstances in which they find themselves. I want to illuminate what those choices look like to one girl trying to become a person during two decades of rapid transformation and powerful reaction in American life. It was a time when new possibilities opened doors and paths my mother and grandmothers could not have imagined. It was a time when ideas and even movements were emerging to challenge assumptions about race, gender, and privilege my parents and grandparents had believed to be immutable. It was a time that inaugurated many of the changes and divisions we grapple with still. Yet it was an era that seems like a foreign country to many of those who are still working to carry out those to carry those advances forward into a more enlightened and just future. The strangeness of that world can perhaps encourage us that at least some things have changed for the better in the course of my lifetime. And at a time when we see many of those advances challenged or even overturned, it can remind us why we don't want to live in such a world again. <clears throat> Now to 1968. I had told friends that I didn't even want to go to graduation, partly reflecting a 1960s era disdain for pomp and circumstance, partly because I felt so disheartened about the world around me. But at Bryn Mawr, you had to show up to collect your diploma. So I joined my classmates on an unusually cold spring morning to mark the end of my college experience. 32 members of the class that had entered with me in 1964 were no longer with us. A sizable 16% of our original cohort. Some had transferred, some had just dropped out. But in one way or another, many represented casualties of the 60s. And some of those who did graduate with me in 1968 and adjacent years would eventually join that category as well. The upheavals in values and possibilities, the new freedoms and accompanying dangers, the intensity and engagement of our college generation, the specter of Vietnam and the draft, all conspired in a way that made coming of age as a thinking and feeling person in those years like walking on the edge of a precipice. An accumulation of often casually made choices could lead to disaster. Commitments to principled action could entail enormous risks or sacrifices. Toxic relationships, bad drug trips, sexual experiments, and errors of human judgment could yield outcomes that distorted or damaged lives, sometimes irreparably. It felt like there was more at stake, more at risk for my generation than for those that had preceded us. Mary Patterson McPherson, Dean of the college, later Bryn Mawr's sixth president, has described to me the atmosphere of almost constant crisis in which she had to operate. I spent night after night in the Bryn Mawr hospital, hoping, she said, somebody wouldn't die from a drug overdose or alcohol poisoning or a suicide attempt. She regularly bailed out Haverford and Bryn Mawr students arrested at protests or political confrontations. She was constantly, she said, worried about people doing themselves in, in one way or another. As I graduated, I looked back and thought how lucky I was to have skirted catastrophe. More than a half century later, I can imagine the myriad ways it might have been otherwise. I did not disappear, like my friend Kit, into a Chicago jail and then into the weather underground. I did not blow myself up building a bomb in a Greenwich Village townhouse, as one Bryn Mawr graduate a few years ahead of me did. I did not have to seek a back alley abortion or drop out of school after the effects of a botched one, as one close friend did. 
Unlike the girl in my biology class who disappeared in the middle of the semester, I did not get pregnant and have to marry and later divorce my boyfriend. I didn't have to go to Canada or prison to escape the draft, and I did not die in Vietnam or have to endure its cruelties. I did not get beaten or killed doing civil rights work in the South. I was not convicted of felony murder for my role in a Black Liberation Army, Army robbery of a Brinks van, as was a member of the Bryn Mawr class of 1965. I did not descend into the fantastical universe of mind-altering drugs. And unlike Holly Maddox, who was a freshman at Bryn Mawr when I was a senior, I was not murdered, dismembered, and stashed in a trunk by a charismatic but crazy countercultural pen boyfriend. I had managed, in the words of Albert Camus, not to become a victim, and I was still struggling not to be an executioner. Yet, even in the nightmare of 1968, even as the Black freedom and student movements embraced violence and veered in directions I could not follow, even as American politics, all but destroyed what Kidd had described as our enduring but inaccurate faith in America. I remain glad to have had a time when I had had a reason to believe, ideals to strive for, a glimpse of a beloved community. In the long run, it would prove sustaining because I could always hope to find it again. I think I'll stop there and turn it over to Tamiko, Dean Brown Nagan. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Drew, for that uh, moving reading of your beautifully poetic writing. Uh, very stirring. And I'm so happy to be in conversation with you. I thought I would start by asking you to say a little bit more about what inspired you to write the memoir, perhaps reflecting on your years growing up in Virginia? I felt that I had lived in a world that was disappearing so quickly, gladly in most ways, that young people today, so many people today really didn't know what it had been like, didn't understand from the, from the trivial to the cosmic what the 1950s and 60s had been. Most importantly, didn't understand the kinds of gender and racial restraints and casual asides um, that were made routinely in my childhood and the kinds of um, expectations that were so limited um, for women and for African-Americans. I wanted to document that. I mean, I found teaching so many students who couldn't believe that water fountains had signs on them that said white and colored in my lifetime. But almost more, more circumstantially, just the, the cruelties of everyday life, the put downs, the exclusions that, that pervaded the world in that era. And then all the, the things that almost seemed silly in, in some ways that were part of that, that time as well. Um, I, I think of food, the horrible food that we ate, um, canned, processed, um, the advertisement in Life magazine for make up all your leftovers in jello salad week, you know, things like that, that we just take for granted as part of the world, um, as gone from the world we live in now, but set the tone and the environment within which I was a young person. Another thing I think of was clothes that young women had to wear. First of all, I had to wear skirts to class in college. Who could imagine such a thing? But the kinds of girdles and, and other constraining apparatuses that young women were expected to wear, just things of that sort that, that I wanted to share as a kind of texture of what that life was like, as well as the big issues that I think have, have been um, forgotten in many ways uh, in, in our own era. Mm -hmm. Well, let me pick up on your reference to the big issues. Um, you know, one of the things that's so impressive about this memoir is that it's a perfect example of uh, a memoir and the social and political history of the 1950s and 60s intertwined. 
And I wonder if you can talk a bit about the craft of writing such mm -hmm. a history and whether it was different in some ways from writing an historical monograph. Domiko, I so appreciate that compliment coming from you as such an accomplished historian. Thank you. When I conceived of this book, I really had in my mind the notion of history memoir. And that revolved around the one of the phrases in the prologue where I talk about history representing the choices that are available to someone in a certain era. And so I wanted to show my life and the choices I made, but I wanted to show the whole environment of choices and denial of choices that surrounded me. And so I wanted to situate myself in a historical moment. And so I did a lot of research for this book, not just digging through family papers and so forth, but trying to figure out, okay, what what was it, how many young women did go to college and in my era, in my mother's era, in my grandmother's era? What was the um, reception, for example, of Sputnik? I always remember that I was terrified when Sputnik went up, up but I wanted to see what the more general um, mood of the country was in the aftermath of Sputnik. And I saw quite quickly how my terror was very much informed by the sense of panic in the nation at large that somehow the Russians had surpassed us and by the whole Cold War ideology that I grew up in and, and imbued, inhaled almost without being aware of it. And so understanding those larger trends was a really important part for me of tracing what ways my path went as I navigated through, through those larger social issues. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Let me ask you about the title of your book, Necessary Trouble, quoting the late civil rights icon and congressman John Lewis. Can you talk a little bit about why you gave the book this title and say a little bit about your relationship with Congressman Lewis? One of the greatest privileges of my presidency was getting to know John Lewis. I think I first encountered him when he came and was asked by the National Endowment for the Humanities to give a little introductory reading before I gave a big lecture that they invited me to give, the Jefferson Lecture, in uh, 2011. It was actually the day, the 50th anniversary to the day that he left Washington, D.C. to go on his first freedom ride. Mm. And so we had an exchange about that. And I'd always admired him from the time I was um, in college and saw him risk his life and have his head beaten on the Edmund Pettus Bridge as he marched in the Selma, the first of the Selma marches, Bloody Sunday, um, and seeing someone sacrifice that much and be so dedicated. Here he was all these decades later in Congress, still fighting the, the struggle for um, the beloved community for equal rights and justice. And he then came to Harvard a number of times while I was president. We gave him an honorary degree. He came and this will, as you know, fit very neatly with something you've worked very hard on, which is Harvard's effort to um, unearth its history with slavery. And we had found the names, or um, a seminar of students actually, had found the names of four enslaved people who had worked in the house of the Harvard president in the 18th century. And we were putting up a plaque with their names to memorialize their presence in the early life of Harvard. And he agreed to come and speak at the dedication. And it was just such a memorable moment in my presidency, really in my life. Mm. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and then he came and spoke at my last commencement. And as he was beginning his remarks, he turned to me and he talked about uh, an early protest I'd made for civil rights. And he said, thank you, Madam President, for making necessary trouble. Mm -hmm. So when I was writing this book and looking for a title, I thought that a real theme in the book was how I was just always difficult. I was always in revolt against my parents. I was always um, upsetting people uh, with my political views and my refusal to go along with the set of expectations that surrounded me as a young woman in Virginia who was supposed to become a lady in that white supremacist society. And I, I really was just in revolt against it from an early age. But I was in revolt for myself in considerable part, because if I didn't make that trouble, I felt myself would be extinguished. And so this was trouble 
that was necessary trouble for me. And so the whole book in a way is about how I escaped Virginia, escaped those constraints by making trouble that was absolutely necessary for my survival. Mm -hmm. So a couple of months before he died, actually, um, I had a phone conversation with John Lewis and I asked him if I could have his permission to use these words for the title. I somehow just felt I couldn't take those words without telling him, asking him, receiving his blessing. And he was always such a gracious person. Of course, he responded with that graciousness and said he would be honored and pleased. And so there's the title of the book, a kind of tribute to him, but also very much a description of what I think the book is about, which is the trouble I felt it was necessary to make given the horrible expectations that were surrounding me as a young person. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Now, one of the epigraphs from the book is about this notion of necessary uh, trouble. Another is from To Kill a Mockingbird, um, which says, you want to grow up to be a lady, don't you? I said, not particularly. <laughs> um, which I think captures the way in which you were expected to grow up to be a Southern lady in your privileged environs in Virginia, uh, but you rejected those expectations. I wonder if you could talk to us about what motivated you to reject uh, the gender conventions of the day. Well, I started young at this um, to my mother's dismay. Uh, she was always trying to make me wear little frilly things. And I remember I couldn't have been more than about two when she announced that I should wear these little frilly pants, underpants on top of my regular little cotton underpants. <laughs> and she called them fancy pants. And I just thought that was ridiculous. And they itched and I had three brothers and I think that's key. And no one told them they had to wear fancy pants. So what was this inequity in my in my young life? And I just refused. I'd take them off. If she put me up, put them on, I'd go in the other room and take them off and hide them. And so I was in revolt against fancy pants. And that was kind of the first gender constraint. <clears throat> and then I was very good at school. And my the headmaster of my school, the head of my school at the end of my second grade year, urged my mother to have me read less that the coming summer than I had the previous summer. Enough is enough. Hmm. Um, that's not what I was supposed to be doing. And so there are just so many parts of my, I was very much a outdoors person. I wanted to raise um, animals and, and horses and cows and sheep on our farm, rather than do the things that girls in the 4-H club, which I joined, were supposed to do, which was learn how to can fruits. And so I wasn't having any of that. <laughs> I went off and went into the boys division. And there I was with I don't know, 11 or 12 boys. And we were discussing what the best feed was for our steers or how to manage our animals. So I just was constantly pushing back. And then I began pushing back about what I soon saw to be an even larger inequity than the ones I was subjected to, which was the situation of the African-American people who surrounded me in, in 1950s Virginia. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about that. Um, you write of having an epiphany um, that revealed to you what it meant to be white, particularly in Virginia in the wake of Brown versus Board of Education. Can you talk about that epiphany? Mm -hmm. So the epiphany came one day when I was nine years old and I was being driven home from school by an African man named Rayfield who worked for my family doing, you know, mowing the lawn, shining my father's shoes, driving us kids around. He always said he was carrying us. I like that, that carrying mm -hmm. seems so tender in a way and in, in his regard for us. Um, so I was in the car and the radio was on and a reporter on the radio and announcer was talking about some of the controversy that had emerged in Virginia in the wake of the Brown v. Board school integration decision. And Virginia um, decided the white leadership of Virginia, notably headed by Harry Byrd, Senator Harry Byrd, who lived just down the road from us. Mm -hmm. um, he argued that Virginians should not integrate their schools, they should close them rather than comply with the Supreme Court order. So this became a kind of basis of defiance of the federal government in Virginia was much talked about and kind of raised race into a very explicit 
conversation. So much of it had been understood through silences, unspoken um, kinds of repressions and um, uh, traditions, I would say, white traditions of, of suppression that had been perfected in the years after emancipation. And suddenly race was front and center. And so it made me see things in a way I hadn't before. I'd just taken things for granted. And most notably, I had just taken for granted that my school was all white. I thought, well, that's the way it is. No one's keeping anybody out. And suddenly I realized that black children couldn't come to my school by law. So I said to Raphael, is that right? That black children are excluded from my school? He said nothing. So I asked him again, if I put black, if I painted my face black, I couldn't go to my school tomorrow. He said nothing. Hmm. And his silence was in many ways more revealing than anything he could have said. I mean, I think if we look at, at it from his perspective, he was not gonna endanger himself by getting involved in some kind of conversation about race with a nine-year-old girl, white girl. But um, he also wasn't gonna hide it. You know, he wasn't gonna deny or, or cover it over. He just left it there. Mm -hmm. And I was outraged. This seemed to me against everything I'd been taught in terms of the Declaration of Independence and American, all men are created equal, all this civic ideology I'd learned in school. And also our family belonged to an Episcopal church and God said all oh, people are equal, yellow and brown and so forth. And that it seemed completely at odds with the Christianity I'd been taught. And so I went home and I sat down and I wrote an irate letter to Eisenhower and telling him what he should do about integration. And um, I found this letter in the early 2000s. Uh, I said to myself, for years, I wrote this letter. And then I began to wonder, did I really? Am I making it up? And so I communicated with the National Archives and they found it in the Eisenhower Library and sent it to me. And so it is the frontest piece of the book in my little crabbed nine-year-old handwriting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It, it's, it's a beautiful letter. Um, I want to talk about a concept that unites your work on the Civil War and your memoir, and that's the notion of historical memory. You write about the force and the burden of history and living in the shadow of history. I wonder if you could talk a bit about what it was like to grow up in the shadow of Southern history and how it shaped your outlook? In many ways, it was as if I was growing up in the 1860s instead of the 1950s and 60s, because the Civil War seemed so omnipresent when I was a child. And of course, the racial arrangements that came out of the Civil War were in place and just beginning to be challenged. So that, that cast the era into sharp relief as well. But as a child, I think our major game that we all played together was reenacting Civil War battles out in the, the, far, the um, uh, woods and the fields around our house. We had little guns and we'd chase each other around. And my brother, my older brother, was quite a Civil War buff and knew quite a bit. And so he'd order us around and tell us which battle we were fighting. He always got to be Lee. I had to be Grant because Lee was the hero of the lost cause ideology with which we grew up. And I, I say, and it's only partly a joke that it took me a long time to realize that Grant had actually won the war mm. because in many ways where I lived, Lee and many of the values that he embraced and the social inequities that were at the foundation of his life persisted into, into the era in, in which I was a child. So that was one way that the war seemed omnipresent. And adults in my life also referred to it constantly. I lived on the Lee Jackson Highway. Things were named after Civil War um, heroes, Confederate heroes. And so this was past and present merged in a way that I think had an enormous effect in making me a historian, realizing the, the burden of, of that history. I have a quote from Robert Penn Warren, the white Southern poet and writer uh, who said, history is what you can't resign from. And I, I think that that says a lot about 
growing up white in, in the in the South in the area in which I did. Mm -hmm. Well, let's shift from talking about growing up in Virginia to the North. You matriculated uh, to Concord Academy when you were 13 years old. I wonder if you could talk a bit about that experience and how it shaped you. It was a transformative experience for me. Uh, Concord Academy was then an all girls school and it had a quite remarkable headmistress who believed that rules should not govern young people. They should, uh, within limits, of course, figure things out for themselves. So in the array of places I might have been sent as a boarding student, this was among the least restrictive. It was also a place that took girls and their intellects extremely seriously. So here I was in this world of women, most of the teachers, there are a few exceptions, but most of the teachers were women. This head of school was a person who thought she could do just about anything. She drove a tractor around building a skating rink. She moved a, a little church in New Hampshire, board by board, not all by herself, but with others, uh, moved it from New Hampshire and reconstructed it on the, on the Concord Academy campus where it stands to this day as the Concord Academy Chapel. She gave us uh, talks a couple of times a week that were really excellent moral exhortations about being honorable and good and caring about the world. Uh, and so all of this was really inspiring to me. And I felt that I began to see a path for using my brain and imagining a life that was beyond the constraints of ladyhood with which I had uh, grown up. Mm -hmm. Terrific. And what about Bryn Mawr, one of the seven sisters, uh, colleges, historically female colleges, um, you matriculated there. And can you say a bit about what you learned about uh, women and their place in society there? Well, Bryn Mawr, also a world of women and um, a world in which I saw what we might consider for the first time role models. Mm -hmm. The professors there were overwhelmingly female. And I think that's where I first began to imagine that's something I might be. I had not seen women. I'd seen teachers, obviously, at Concord, and I'd seen the head of Concord who had run something. But in Virginia, my mother and her social circle all were. Um, wives within the household. I think maybe one of them was a teacher, but otherwise I saw, you know, no working women, no women who were doctors or lawyers or business people. And I got to Bryn Mawr and we were told that we had, we could compete with any man. We could do whatever we wanted in the world. Um, and it was just up to us. It was also a very self-consciously intellectual place. Mm -hmm. We all had to take philosophy beginning with the Greeks and the classics were much honored and we had enormous amounts of reading and homework that we were expected to do. Uh, and that was um, the, the environment. But it was also an interesting environment in terms of feminism or not feminism. And my classmates and I in the 60 or whatever number of years since have, have thought about this a lot because it basically said, you can be as good or better than any man. It didn't say change the world so that women have a place. It's just, you're gonna be the best. Mm. So even if other women don't have a chance, you will. So it was a, a, a kind of assimilationist, I guess, or you know, show the men that you're just as good, but not change the world so that there are more opportunities for women. So it was a place that was um, in some ways inspiring because it made us feel we could do things. Um, that we hadn't imagined before, but at the same time, it didn't equip us very well to deal with the hurdles of um, limitations on women's lives that still were very much in place when we graduated in 1968. Mm -hmm. Those were a surprise to us after this environment in which women had run everything and told us we could do anything. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, let's shift to your activism mm -hmm. for social change. Uh, you were deeply engaged in social and political issues as illustrated by your trip across the Iron Curtain, your civil rights and anti-Vietnam War activism. I wonder if you can talk about what it was about these issues that spurred you and so many of your peers 
to take action, and of course, the attendant risks of action. I think we felt a sense of urgency and emergency. Mm. And some of that came from growing up as Cold War babies and thinking the whole world could blow up. And a, a really important moment for me was when I was at Concord and um, I was a junior and the Cuban Missile Crisis happened. And I remember sitting in a classroom with five or six of my friends in the evening, long after classes had gone, we were sitting on the top of desks, just talking to each other about was the world gonna end tomorrow mm -hmm. and what we would have missed in life if it did end. Now, on one level, you can say that was young girls being overdramatic, only it wasn't. Mm -hmm. and, and in retrospect, we see that we were very lucky not to be blown up. And I think that urgency sent me off to Eastern Europe with a Quaker group to figure out how young people could make peace across the divide of the Iron Curtain. Um, and then racial issues seem so urgent. And for example, seeing John Lewis be beaten on the head on television, even in the um, primitive black and white kind of television coverage that existed in, in that period. It's just, you know, to borrow the words of Fannie Lou Hamer in a slightly different civil rights context, is this America? You know, what, what can we believe in if this is what we do, if this is the way the world operates? And then the Vietnam War, again, seemed hugely urgent and was hugely urgent for the young men we knew at the um, college with which Bryn Mawr had very close ties, Haverford College. We saw our boyfriends, our classmates, you know, we had many classes together with Haverford, uh, subject to the draft and their lives were being put at risk with the possibility of going to Vietnam and having to fight in this war that we could see no justification for. And so I think that was a major inspiration for our anti-Vietnam activism, the moral issue of what on earth were we doing to the Vietnamese people, but also a very personal survival issue of who is going to go to have to go to war and who is going to be drafted. Mm -hmm. Well, we have quite a few audience questions and I'm going to turn to some of them now. Um, the first one I would like to ask is, how did you decide which stories to include in your memoirs and which to leave out? And how did you curate the material? Someone wants to know. That's a really interesting question. I, I didn't sit and think, well, I'm gonna leave this out. And in fact, I've had um, memories that have come to me in the weeks and months since it was published. And I thought, oh, I should have put that in. So some of the things I left out were things that I just didn't think of. The book also started to write itself in a way. When I wrote a proposal for the book, it was more episodic, it was more, going to be snapshots. Mm -hmm. But as I started to write, I began to see links and that would prompt other stories. And then I would go dig around in materials from my family or materials I'd saved. I come from a line of pack rats and I'm a pack rat. So I still have a great heap of stuff in the other room that I've got to, I guess, send to the Harvard archives. But mm -hmm. I'd discover something in, in those materials and that would spark another another story. And so the stories began to have a continuity and a logic and a, a narrative arc, I guess I'd say, that, that kind of took me from one to the other. And I think that was a real prompt for what came to mind as I, as I proceeded. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Um, we have several questions about how you came to attend Concord Academy, given how different the school was from the environment in which you grew up? My mother was from New Jersey, and I think she always um, hated the South, to be frank, and hmm. didn't like what it was becoming in the aftermath of Brown v. Board with all the controversies about schools and so forth. And she thought that New England and the North had much better schools than the South. Hmm. So she went on a trip and looked at uh, a bunch of schools in New England and took me with her to see the one she liked the best. And someone had recommended Concord to her. And people say to me, how on earth 
would you have, even among boarding schools, how did you end up in that one? Because it was so much more enlightened than many of the others. But it just got put on a list. My mother was impressed by the head of school when she met her. And when I went to visit, there was one thing that particularly impressed me. Um, when you were late at Concord, if you were late for class or late for dinner, whatever it was, you didn't get demerits or you didn't get black marks. You had to saw a piece of wood. Hmm. You had to, there's a big pile of wood and it all got sawed by derelict young students who were late. And so that was very annoying to have to do. And it was in the winter always that you had to do it hmm. uh, or almost always. And um, it was cold and unpleasant. And it made you think, I really don't want to be late to class again, hmm. but it was no big deal. And it just seemed to me the absolute right way to think about small infractions, you know, make someone alert to them, but have a little bit of a sense of humor about it. And that to me said something about the mood of the school, the attitude of the school, that as a, I was a 12 year old when I looked at the school, that seemed to a 12 year old, like a really good sign. Mm -hmm. And it, indeed it was, it said something about the school. Mm -hmm. Very good. We have a question asking, do you think you were aware of the precarity of your experience? The precipice you wrote about at the time when you came of age, or is that knowledge that came later with hindsight? That's a great question. I would say both. As I saw what I call the human casualties happening around me, for example, when friends came back from illegal abortions bleeding and we had to decide, were we going to take them to the hospital and risk arrest, or were we going to try to take care of them ourselves? That was a very, very scary thing. And we knew it. Mm -hmm. um, we knew the draft was very scary. But some of the things that I referred to in that little section that I read, I really wasn't aware of until later. Holly Maddox, the most dramatic, the one who had the crazy countercultural charismatic boyfriend who chopped her up in pieces, mm -hmm. that wasn't discovered until much later. She disappeared. No one knew what had happened to her. But it is, in a sense, emblematic of these kind of dangerous relationships that many people got themselves in when they were on drugs or just trying out new freedoms in a world that wasn't yet structured to prepare people for those freedoms. Mm -hmm. So in retrospect, I saw much more of that. As I got older and became a parent, mm -hmm. I thought, oh, my goodness, that was really bad. Right. <laughs> um, talking to the dean, as I did to interview her, I quoted from her, I interviewed her for the book. She put it in perspective within the many decades that she was a leader at an administrator at Bryn Mawr. So mm -hmm. I see it now more clearly, but I saw a lot of the danger when I was in the middle of it as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, there are several questions asking how we might learn from history in the present moment. Well, that's, that's such a big question. One thing I hoped people would learn from this book is that things do change, things have changed. I worry that there's a dispiritedness among a lot of young people now that nothing has changed, so why bother? But if you read this book and see some of the accepted ways of living in terms of both race and gender, the things we talked about at the, the very beginning, Tamiko. Um, I think you can see that a lot has changed and a lot changed because people invested in making it change. Mm -hmm. And so part of the message from history is it's up to you. You know, the arc of the moral universe doesn't bend. It has to be bent towards justice. And that's part of what I think history can show us. Mm -hmm. I think it also shows us contingencies, how choices, and that goes back to your the question you just asked about being on the precipice. There are contingencies where what, a person goes one way or another, and it can really matter for the future what choice that person makes so or that leader makes. I mean, suppose John Lewis hadn't decided to do something different in his life and hadn't made trouble for his parents. They were very upset with his revolutionary ideas when he was a young man, but he stood up to them and listened to the moral voice inside his head and it made a huge difference. So 
I think history can show us that as a model for our own behavior as we think about what we ought to be doing as we look to the future. Mm -hmm. um, there are several questions, um, let's see, about what influences growing up inspired you to step into leadership roles? I was always bossy. <laughs> From a very young age, um, somehow, I mean, partly I think it was because I was I was pretty smart, but I also thought I knew better than people. Uh, and my grandfather called me Little Miss Fix It. Ah. So I always thought I could probably help with things. And I've had this moral fervor that I ought to if I could. So I think Possibly leadership roles came out of that. For those of you who know my biography, you know I did not take on a major leadership role in academia until I came to Harvard in my 50s. I stayed in the classroom very determinedly. That's what I wanted to do. The Radcliffe Institute seemed to me like a place I could mix my scholarship and a leadership role. And then lo and behold, suddenly here I am, president of Harvard, and something I never expected. And certainly never would have announced as a life goal when I was a college student, people would have thought I was crazy. Mm -hmm. So I guess a bit of it is accidental, but I think it comes out of, out of temperament and bossiness mm -hmm. at the beginning. <laughs> wow. Well, thank goodness that you transitioned to leadership roles and that you were bossy. I like that <laughs> a lot. Um, there's a question asking if you will write a sequel on your life after 1968. I'm not going to. Uh, I think the inspiration of this book was really talking about or having the ability to talk about getting out of Virginia. And the book ends with my leaving Virginia and voting for the first time and being a college graduate and, and becoming an adult. So. If it were fiction, you'd call it a Bildungsroman. I don't know what the right word for um, non-fictional story of growing up is, or if there's a particular word, but but that's really what it is. And I don't want to write about what happened after that. It just, mm -hmm. it's not the same story. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a wise choice. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Someone would like to know if you have thoughts on how to find optimism or hope during challenging times. Oh, well, the section that I read with all the terrible things that happened to people, there's a little bit of optimism at the end, um, which says, you know, the world was kind of imploding, yet I'd had this glimpse of what was possible of a beloved community, of people committing themselves to change on behalf of their ideals. And so I know humans have it in them to do that and can believe that they can have it in them to do that again. Mm -hmm. So my experience says there is reason for optimism, but I think you also can find reason for optimi optimism by turning to to history, to, to reading about people who have struggled in face of seemingly insuperable odds and recognizing that it's a luxury in a sense, not to be optimistic, that to be optimistic is, is to be idealistic and to not settle for a world that's less than what we think it should be. So hope is, is imperative. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Um, there is a really good question here, I think, asking, as your beliefs evolved, how did it impact your relationships with your family? Did their views on issues of the day, like women's roles, change over time as well? Well, the book begins with my mother's death. And many people have said to me, this is really a book about my relationship with my mother. And that's what characterizes my childhood and even the years uh, after she died, uh, up until I was 21. She died when I was 19. Um, I think that's right. So her removal from the scene 
took away the biggest force trying to contain me mm-hmm. and make me a lady. Mm-hmm. People around me cared less about that uh, than she did. So in a sense, I was freed from that battle. I never resolved the relationship. We had a giant fight right before she died. And so that relationship was never brought to any kind of logical, peaceful conclusion. I thought sometimes that writing this book was a way of resolving that relationship at last, much, much later. My father continued to be a conservative white Virginian. He lived his life much the same until he died in 2000. He didn't try to impose his views on me, but we mostly never talked about politics or anything having to do with race, gender. He evolved somewhat on those questions as the world began to change around him, but he still was an active Republican wrote in his 50th reunion book for um, Princeton that he just deplored what was going on on college campuses. This would would have been in the early 90s. Mm. And when I read it, I was looking through his book. I thought I was teaching at Penn at the time. I thought, that's interesting. He's (laughs) never said this to me. I wonder (laughs) what he thinks is going on on my campus. So we remained in a kind of um, distant, declaration of peace, I guess. Mm -hmm. My brothers, interestingly, especially my older brother, who was a lawyer in Virginia, his whole life really never fled the way the others of us did. The two younger brothers and I fled Virginia. He stayed there, still there. But he has, and he, in a way, was like an older generation. He graduated from college in 65, went into the Navy, was in the Pacific, in the Navy for four years, kind of during the years when sex, drugs, and rock and roll happened, he was gone. Mm. Um, But he came back and he's become a real activist in Virginia with the NAACP. Mm. He's on a committee in Virginia um, of the Episcopal Church to figure out how to spend the reparations that the Episcopal Church has put aside for racial reconciliation. He's he's really out there um, doing, doing wonderful work and I think has has moved very distinctly towards much greater engagement with the issues that that I describe in my book. So my siblings and I are all very much in the same place mm. politically. My father's now dead. Mm. So there's no there was no settling of those differences. Mm-hmm. They just expired, shall I say. Mm-hmm. Someone would like to know what was the most difficult aspect of writing this memoir, and you may have already covered that with your mother, or no? Well, difficult in the way of craft or difficult emotionally, do you think? I, should I talk about craft since I talked about my mother? Sure, sure, yes. And um, Tamiko, I wonder if you'd identify with this, if you've ever tried to do any personal writing or memoir type writing. Um, I'm sorry if I've missed it, but I'll ask you that um, in case. I. I'm a historian. A memoir has to have a voice and a person inside it. And so how how would I do that? And I, I really wanted an editor I could work closely with who could push me about that. And I was very blessed to have such an editor, a Harvard alum, Jonathan Delassi, who may be known to some of you on this Zoom or webinar. And he did push me and said, you need to be more personal here. And sometimes I'd say, I don't know how to do that. What do I do? What do you want to know about? And what's become the kind of example to that I've shared a number of times is at one point he said, you've got to do the boyfriends. I said, I have to do the boyfriends. <laughs> so I went back and talked about my boyfriends, but in a way that is not Mary Carr or the completely self-revelatory memoirs that one often sees cited and acclaimed in American life. This is a restrained memoir and a history memoir rather than one that now talks about my sex life in lurid detail or something. (laughs) Have you, have you done personal writing? Have you tried it? You know, uh, the, the project that I'm contemplating is a combination memoir and exploration of the South following the civil war and through the civil rights era. Um, as you may know, I was born in Edgefield County, South Carolina. 
um, which is really historically significant. Um, and I will tell you that it's, it's quite difficult for me. Mm -hmm. I started um, last summer, but it's just difficult um, writing about the historical events, which I've written about many, many times, but from the perspective of history mm -hmm. um, and my family history. On the other hand, it's also, um, I imagine if I'm ever able to do this, uh, it will be really empowering yes. uh, because uh, I, you know, I've had opportunities in this country that my parents could never have imagined uh, until ultimately it'll be a story I think about change, but getting through that really difficult um, uh, period about history in a way that incorporates some some reflections on family mm -hmm. is it's going to take a long time <laughs> to do. Well, that. I can't wait to read it. I too, as you know, I've written about Edgefield County yeah. um, in a biography of the of a planter in Edgefield County and enslaver who left meticulous records of the injustices he imposed on, on um, the many, many individuals who were enslaved on his plantations, so. Right, I know that well. And I, uh, since you mentioned that book, you know, a part of the story to tell is about deconstructing race um, in America, what it was and what it's come to mean over time. And so it, it's very complicated, mm -hmm. but I do hope that I can get around to writing that at some point. You know, I, I very much wanted this book to be um, about being white and what, what that part of my identity meant and discovering it and coming to terms with it, because I think it's, it's hard to do, but it's not done enough, I believe. And it, if we're going to understand this racial dynamic in our country, we need to understand that part of it, too. And I wanted to make my personal contribution to that conversation. Mm -hmm. And thank you for doing so. Um, there are many more questions. Let's see, we're running out of time if I can find. Um, someone would like to know more about your participation in Selma. What was it like? What compelled you to go? I went to the Selma March in uh, March of 1965 really because of watching the television and seeing John Lewis's head bashed in and thinking, I have to do something. And Martin Luther King said, all good Americans, I ask you to come and bear witness. I was in the spring of my freshman year at um, Bryn Mawr College. I had all these, it was just as this giant paper that all freshmen had to write was due, it was midterms. I just decided, heck, I'm gonna go anyway. Um, I left a draft of my paper, which was handwritten with, a friend to type. And I went to my sociology professor and said, I'm skipping the midterm. He said, I want you to call every 24 hours while you're down there. So I can send in the cavalry. If you disappear, I don't know what the cavalry would have been exactly, but it was very nice of him. So my boyfriend and I borrowed a car and drove to Selma. We arrived just very short time before the march was starting on the, the Sunday. And we went to Brown Chapel where the marchers were starting. And we marched the first day, which was about eight miles, I think. Um, it was exhilarating. We weren't sure if we were going to be killed or not. We were very glad on the way down when um, the radio announced that Johnson had federalized the National Guard, which meant that the kind of reception John Lewis had received a few days earlier or 10 days earlier, really, um, was unlikely to happen when he went over the Edmund Pettus Bridge and was greeted by literally the cavalry, mm -hmm. uh, people, a posse on horseback with whips and clubs and tear gas and so forth. So that wasn't going to happen, but um, we were a little nervous nonetheless. And as I was walking towards Brown, Brown Chapel, one of the National Guards just took off and punched me in the breast. Mm -hmm. I was kind of startled by that, but uh, there was a lot of hate and anger uh, in, among the white population about outside agitators like us uh, coming down. It was unforgettable for me. I, I just went back to Selma 10 days ago, actually, mm -hmm. and marched over the bridge again and thought about what that bridge had meant and worried also, worried 
about what's happened with voting rights and the triumph of that march with the passage of the Voting Rights Act the following summer, an act that's been eroded in recent years with the Shelby decision in 2013 and other decisions. And so thinking the struggle is on, we've got to still keep, keep doing what we do mm -hmm. and, and can do to make John Lewis's goals, make the goals of that whole movement and the people who sacrifice so much mm. to keep them in, in view. Well, that's a wonderful note to end on. I wanna give you the opportunity to explain why you were in Selma. I know you were on this wonderful HAA sponsored trip. Can you talk uh, about that? Yeah. Or why I was in Selma last week. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the HAA sponsored a civil rights trip um, that I was privileged to be the faculty resource person on. And it was Kate Gallard, who you, you saw at the beginning of the program, was on it. It was just an unforgettable experience going back to sites where civil rights actions had taken place. And we met with a number of individuals who had been active in, in critical encounters. For example, many of you may know the photograph of Little Rock with a young woman in a white dress being spat upon. We met with the woman in the white dress mm -hmm. who is now an elderly person as am I. And she told us how that year at Little Rock High School left her with post-traumatic stress disorder that she's dealt with her whole life as she confronted and sacrificed, confronted the hatred and sacrificed to make sure that that school would be open to African-American students. It was beyond inspiring, really. Mm -hmm. So thanks to the HAA for, for this today, but also thank you for so many of the other things it does as well. Wonderful, I agree. And I'm afraid we're out of time. So we'll have to end the program uh, here. I want to thank you, uh, Drew Gilbin Faust for this fabulous conversation. I want to thank the audience for all of your questions. I'm sorry we could not get to more of them. I also want to mention that today's program has been recorded and it will be posted on Radcliffe's website along with information about our upcoming programs. And I hope you will join us for something in the future. Thank you again to everyone and have a good evening.